the uh, process that might lead you to, to solve a problem. Uh, there's no reason why this should be so, except for a tradition of what kind of, of, of discourse is, is accepted by mathematicians and, and physicists as, as the proper thing to formalize. Uh, and in the same way as one would seek to, to, to give the computer more power by telling it about powerful ideas, uh, we would seek to, do seek to give the child more power by giving him primary access to that sort of idea rather than the, the, the more formal differential equations and so on. Can't flunk the same intelligence test twice. Let me start by saying that one of the wonderful things about being invited to this uh, symposium here at Berkeley is it's practically the only time that two people from Cambridge ever talk to each other is <laughs> when they're both in Berkeley. Uh, my, my reaction to what Professor Pappert says, as I said in my talk, is frankly to be torn both ways. Um, let me try to, I think what he said is clarifying and helpful. Let me try to restate my difficulty. So you're left with both the difficulty and the answer, and you can <laughs> make up your own mind. The difficulty I see it is this, that the existing programs, as opposed to what is programmatic, are very special purpose. Either they have the defect of really building in a very restricted solution space, or they have the defect of the normal form theorem proving programs that they really depend on exploiting some special mathematical fact. And in the case of the theorem proving programs, it's a fact called the Erbron theorem that says that if something can be proved at all, it can be proved in a certain normal form. And one or two rather simple theorems about propositional calculus and quantification theory, and then just using the fact that the machine you know, can do many computations per minute neither of which seems to have a great deal of generality. Now, when I made the remarks I did, um, what I had in mind was the following, that if one thought, and this is, uh, Professor Pappert is right, this is not taking account, this is thinking perhaps of an older stage of artificial intelligence, if one thought that one was going to have an insightful model of human cognitive structure by combining special purpose programs like the chess playing program, like the program for understanding this particular story, like the analogies program and so on, that the accumulation of a vast number of such programs, or the concatenation in such a way, since some of them would operate on others, call up others, and so on, that the concatenation of a vast number of such programs would ever be a model for human cognitive structure, then that has to be wrong, I think. Put it this way, it may well be true that a model for us is a concatenated system of programs in some sense of program. But it can't be simply a concatenated system of highly special purpose programs, each of which has a very restricted solution space. And one reason it can't be is just the incredible number of such programs that would be needed. And if that's the solution to the problem, the one sure thing is we'll never get it. Um, but secondly, I think there are very strong evolutionary arguments against that. I mentioned them before, but the thrust of the argument is this, I want to repeat, that human be if you take an animal like a turtle 
or a seal or a shark or a dolphin. You always explain the most outstanding features of that animal as adaptations to specific problems that it faced when it was evolving. You say the turtle has this shell because it had many enemies. They like to eat turtles, even uncooked. And the shell is like a fortress, and it protects the turtle from its enemies. Only in the case of man is the capacity that was completely evolved already 30,000 years ago, a capacity to solve a vast number of problems, the great majority of which were not present in the environment when the capacity was evolved. The problem of solving differential equations was not present in the environment. The problem of writing music criticism was not present in the environment, and so forth. So you're dealing with so that the hypothesis that what we were, are, this may be uh, beating a dead horse, or, but I want to, but nevertheless, I think the point is worth nailing home. The hypothesis that the solution is that the solutions to a lot of individual problems are individually built in is no solution at all. And this is an argument both against that version of AI and against Chomsky's innateness hypothesis. If you're going to take each problem and say, well, this couldn't be learned because it's too hard, therefore the solution was innate, you're going to be in deep trouble. Now, I agree with Seymour with respect to what the direction of motion should then be. That the direction of motion should be towards general rules for solving problems, they call powerful ideas, in particular methodological ideas towards epistemology, scientific methodology, and so on. That seems to me exactly right. I have no quarrel with that. I would only say welcome to the club. Uh, you know, people from Bacon on have been trying to do that. I think some progress has been made. Mother, it's good to go back and read Bacon. He was no dope, and he said a lot of interesting things, like, for example, that this methodology is itself an empirical science, that to do it right it should be done collectively, and so on, none of which are ever mentioned in the caricature of Bacon that is usually presented. So I agree that the turn should be towards epistemology. I certainly am not arguing that in principle we cannot find um, general rules of human functioning. The other, and I do want to emphasize that even if we find such rules, it will not follow that our organization is digital. In fact, one fact that really, if you think about it, one of Professor Papert's examples the example of the computation of where you should catch the baseball, that, 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 that's essentially an analog computer. And the reason that, a, that that reduces the computational complexity of that problem is that a digital computer can perfectly well simulate any analog computer you can describe. In particular, even if our brains were in some sense analog rather than digital computers. If you had a description of the rules the brain follows, then a lot, you know, had we but whirled enough in time at ignoring problems of real-time feasibility, you would undoubtedly be able to simulate that in a digital computer. So once again, the question of what is the most insightful description of our cognitive structure and how do we simulate that on a digital device have to be kept apart, I think. I have one other remark, but maybe I should postpone it till I think Professor Pepper wants to say something else. The other remark will change no, the subject. Like, yeah, on that. <laughs> if I can get this off. Well, on this question of digital, and the second least uh, worrying thing in my life next to the immortality of my soul <laughs> is whether computers are digital or whether I am one. Uh, and I'd like to say it in a very practical sense that as one works with a computer, it might appear to other people who have read an elementary description of how a computer works that it must be very frustrating to deal with this thing with all those little bits there and zeros and ones. And, but in fact, that's almost a metaphor anyway, in that the, the computer is, is bits and, and digital. And, and even apart from the fact that it's a mere metaphor, the evolution of computer science 
has been to get that as far away from your attention, from your world as possible. And, and this comes out in the, in the, in the you see it in the evolution of, of, of programming languages where not only, and this is there's a slight quarrel, a slight extension perhaps of some of the things that were said both by Putnam and Mackay about, about levels in those columns there that in fact what happens in a real computer and is that there are many, many such levels and, and the, the, there is somewhere buried in the, in the heart of that thing some electronics which I never heard of and then there's some, there's some, and it's got much too complicated for me to understand and I don't even try. There's even a machine language that I hardly even try to understand. And, and then there's some assembly language written in the machine language, and there's et cetera. It's, and even if you look at the, at, the more, at, the, at the more recent computer languages for artificial intelligence, there is no trace of seriality in them. There's the tendency is to let you write your languages as if you had free access to multiprocessing. And this has led to some of the important key ideas, some of the important... Uh, I think powerful ideas taken from, from, from the philosophy of science. For example, the idea of demon, that, that, that instead of saying at the precise point in a serial program where such and such a thing is to, is, is, is to be activated, you specify through some, through some set of, of rather vaguely stated conditions in terms of its function and you set it up and it sits there like the, the name is demon and the image is that you have these large number of demons asleep and under certain conditions they will jump up and, and come into, into, and, into action. And doing that sort of thing makes it vastly easier for you to talk about the program, makes the, the writing of, of programs which used to be 10 years ago maybe a, a, a year's work now become maybe a week's work and so on. So the, the, the digitality, the seriality, and so on are, are very far removed from the level at which you try to, to, to formulate the knowledge. And uh, by the way, I think that's very analogous to, to the idea of the artificiality of our intelligence and its re relation to, to biology. And in my old Piaget days, I once said it like this, that a good model of Piaget's view of of how intelligence grows is that the baby is born a biological beast. But if you really want to understand what the dynamic of the evolution of intelligence is, it's the constant struggle to get further and further away from the, the biological, from any effects of the biological substrate. Just like the programmer writing higher and higher level languages is engaged in a constant struggle to, to formulate his, his computer languages in such a way as to have the, 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 the least possible and ultimately no trace of what, the, of, of what computer it's, it's, it's written in. Now, of course, as I said, it's an open question whether this, 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 this model of, of human, of the development of intelligence as, as getting rid of the biological is, 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 is reasonable or not. And it might be that my example of the, of the roast beef is is, comes back to haunt me that it really is like that and that, that although in riding bicycles and in catching balls and in understanding language to some extent and playing chess, we write in a way that, that doesn't seem to use any, any biology, biological function. It might be true that there's some fantastically powerful computational principle built into the, 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 you know, the chemistry of the brain in some who knows what, and it seems to me highly unplausible, but we can never be absolutely sure until we've really solved all these problems that it, that it can't be the case. But anyway, the, it seems that the digital thing simply is not related to the enterprise of, of artificial intelligence, nor the serial thing, and maybe they have some echoes in the sense of, of the total amount of computation, placing a limit maybe on, on what can be done by some kind of, of computer system. And, and that was just one small way in which I disagreed with or would like to modify your statement that one would never see from the functioning of the intelligence what the, 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 the matter was. You might in some limiting sense. And I think Hans Bremermann would, would give, give you a theorem about how given the mass of your brain and the entropy and whatnot, there, there really is some actually calculable limit to the, 